Hello, I'm Sean Lim and welcome to After 10. Molecules may not be at the top of your mind on a daily basis, but just recently, top scientific minds gathered here in Seoul to discuss the future of the molecular sciences. On today's After 10, we meet with one of the world's most preeminent chemists to discuss why science matters to all of us. Stay with us. The next generation of scientists from Korea recently had the opportunity to meet with four Nobel Prize winners. From the most recent Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, Arie Warshall, to the first Middle Eastern woman to win a Nobel Prize, Ada Yona. There were four Nobel Prize winners in total that attended the symposium. Many young scientists with a passion for science not only spoke with the Nobel Prize winners, but with other world-renowned scientists as well. I think always with young people, they respond to opportunity. And the thing you have to do is to make sure that there are good opportunities for them to do the things they really want to do. And I think very often this is a question of giving them the freedom to do the things that they think is important. This symposium differed from a normal one because it wasn't a lecture. The scientists interacted with students through discussions. I want to hear the lectures and think about how I can apply my future career into the advancement of humanity and the science, field of science in general. Originally held only in Sweden, the MFS held its third overseas symposium here in Korea. The host of this symposium, the founder and chairman of the Molecular Frontiers Foundation, Bent Norden. He wasn't only the chairman of the Nobel Committee for Chemistry, but was also the chairman of the chemistry section of the Swedish Research Council. Norden strives for the development of science on a global level. He hopes the opportunity provokes a greater interest in science among the children of Korea. We take a look at the outcome and effects this symposium had. Well, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. It's a pleasure. Well, we were very lucky to have four Nobel Prize winners come into Korea for a visit. What was the purpose here? Well, the purpose of Molecular Frontier Symposium is well, it's twofold. One is to make the, uh, the most eminent scientists in the world meet and get together and get new ideas. And the other, maybe most important one, is to inspire the society and especially the youth. And as you know, we had, I think it was 700 young high school students there yesterday. So the Nobel laureates were the role models, we think, for the future scientists. Well, the Molecular Frontiers Symposium has been going on for years. When did it first start and what really prompted the event? I try to remember. <laughs> In 2001, it was 100 years since the first Nobel Prize. And I then conducted a Nobel Jubilee Symposium. And I decided to pull in uh, chemists, physicists, biologists, medicine scientists from all over the place. It was very heterogeneous and we were a little concerned that it was maybe too superficial, not focused enough. But it turned out that it became a success. By being, uh, combining so many sciences, it turned out that the discussions became very, very interesting and inspiring. And many Nobel laureates there and then said that that was the best conference they have ever been to, including an 85-year-old Nobel laureate, so it tells a lot. And then I thought that maybe we could use this. I could use the network I had from my years as, a, as chairman of the Nobel Committee to pull together these brains and make something that could go out. On. So it sounds like people are very excited to attend. Is there a central question that you guys focus on every year? We what was try it this year? to keep um, uh, central societal problems in the focus. That's environment, medicine, health, and so on. Um, but the vehicle by which we try to uh, go into the future, that's the molecule. 
We are molecules. We have molecules around us. We breathe molecules. We drink molecules. So molecules aren't just limited to chemistry. Your field is chemistry, but you're, you're able to bring in many disciplines that's, that's based right. on this one that's single right. yeah. um, thing, yeah. I guess, the molecule. Yeah. Uh, the MFS was held at the Royal uh, Swedish Academy of Science every year until um, recently you guys decided to span, expand internationally. What was the uh, yeah. impetus behind yeah. that? We thought that this uh, was a very good issue uh, to um, uh, involve the whole world, in, to, to make it global. And um, then some people suggested that Asia uh, would be a good way to go. And um, the first two um, symposia were in Singapore and they were both very successful, very well attended. And uh, the temperature of the discussions, the uh, programs were perfect. And then we looked around and, uh, well, the next country should be either China or Korea. Who is first? And why was and, Korea first? Yeah, well, it's um, the number of things. I think Korean um, uh, scientists are uh, more coherent and clear about the possibilities of using uh, molecular frontiers as a vehicle. Although China is, uh, it's, um, there are pros and cons for both. And we had some contacts. And Korea University was uh, adamant on, on doing this. So they, we, we had a quick invitation. And I understand that it wasn't a traditional um, event where there was just speaker after speaker giving a one-way uh, speech or a lesson. It was um, quite an innovative way of making the discussion happen. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about, well, bit about it? Well, first of all, we let the speakers only speak for 20 minutes, that's very short. You invite the Nobel laureate from California coming here 14 hours and, and then speak for just 20 minutes. Um, so in these 20 minutes, you should present a message and it should be understandable. So these are quite, quite difficult uh, demands we had on it. Then after that, we had panels discussions where we had several speakers, let's say the th first three speakers in a session that came together and who received questions from the audience. And that comes, that is the next unusual thing. Your young people lined up. We had hundreds of them queuing to ask a question, a quick question. And uh, I'm afraid this is the sad thing. Only I think about 5% of all those who queued had the possibility to ask questions. What was on their minds? all kinds of things. They, they uh, were all over the place. And what's nice is that uh, all my speakers, they were very enthusiastic. Um, some of them got new ideas from these uh, questions. Some were very fundamental. Some were, uh, there were no stupid questions. There are, by definition, no stupid questions. You could ask anything. Well, what do you tell uh, children um, who may be interested in science and chemistry um, is you know, some of the main reasons to pursue a mm, path mm, in that direction. Mm. Well, either you want to make a new television uh, or you want to make futures completely new television. In both cases, you need uh, the tools. And um, the best thing is if your toolbox is as easy as possible. The fewer and the more sharp tools you could have and the tools that could dure for a long time, that, that is the best thing. And these are exactly those tools that the fundamental science offers. So instead of having the, the, the ready and empirical tools that might be very complex but might be obsolete in one or two years, you should go for their origins. And I think more and more people begin to realize this. But of course, you need the very applied tools as well. So you need both. And it's rather a matter of taste how you will create your career, whether you want to go for the curiosity driven. You, you need passion. Whatever you do, you need to have a passion for it. Right. So was there a main topic at this, at this conference? Uh, we try to approach the pressing problems in society, that is health, technology, uh, environment, um, but not um, to the extent that uh, we drown the uh, curiosity, the fundamental aspects, the machinery, the mechanisms. But um, 
Next conference, for instance, is uh, about the brain. It will be in May in Stockholm, and it's um, how does memory work? Wow. And learning. Can we explain that on the molecular level? And there are scientists who are in this field. Uh, there yeah. are, but uh, most of them are uh, in a, a field in between. This is the, the problem here. You, you are here and you are here and you have to move through the clouds and there is a lot of turbulence. And so, so these, these questions that you pose, they force interdisciplinary knowledge and people to go outside that, of their normal that's right. fields. Yeah, yeah. Is, is that a little bit scary or are people really excited about that? Um, it, it could be scary uh, when um, politicians tell us to have convergence, that we scientists, mathematicians, physicists, medicinal uh, professors should sit down together shoulder to shoulder and, and address a problem. It never works. This is the worst thing you can do. We have tried it again and again in Europe. Uh, synergy is something called when you go together. It must happen bottom up. It must be the scientists themselves that say, I want to address this problem. I want to do this and that. Then I need to contact he or she and do this and that. So you can't have a government or entity force a result no, to no, happen. No, the, no. the scientist himself has to, or herself has to be the exactly, pioneer and, exactly. and create this. Yeah. But at the same time, are you I'm grateful that uh, societies around the world, and especially here in Korea, we're pushing this creative economy push, so we need to move on to the next generation of growth through uh, creativity and especially the advanced scientists. I, I think sciences. this is very exciting. I think you are on the right way. Um, because creativity is the origin of, of discovery. And discovery is something that you cannot predict. You stumble over something, and your reaction may be, oh, this was ridiculous. Or, it, or your re reaction is, ah, oh, why is it like this? Or, and you become curious. This is called serendipity, that you, uh, the discovery, that you realize that you have a discovery. And that's essential. You, you must understand when you do a discovery. So there are, of course, there's a great interest in the, uh, the Nobel Prizes because they're so prestigious. But uh, they do, when you, when you see the winners, they do seem to be truly hard earned through hard work. Oh, and yes. Yes. Uh, I've read that a, a lot of them are characterized as paradigm shifters. They really change yes. the way yes. that we see a particular a framework of anything. Yeah. Um, how, and you, you were chairman of the committee, uh, how, how do you go about selecting the nominees even? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> we have about uh, three or four hundred nominations every year. And these are uh, people who are invited, universities, uh, individual scientists, they are invited to send in nominations. And we send out about 2,000 invitations every year and get back 300 nominations. And among these, we look for, as you say, paradigm shifts. Uh, this is the number one criteria to get the Nobel Prize. It's not to have a huge production, thousands of uh, publications, or doing lots of small discoveries. There must be something that you could say that you have changed the way we think about things. You have maybe transformed the field which you work in. That is very important. And this year's uh, winner, I believe, changed the way we thought about how uh, ph pharmaceuticals could be delivered? The um, Nobel laureate who visited us yesterday and, and uh, lectured, he has contributed to new um, computer models for how you could look at big biological macromolecules. And um, it's a a system which is based on quantum mechanics to understand the electron motion, but it's also using um, a simpler system with balls and strings that tells the dynamics of a big system. And it's a, uh, it's a matter of how you can uh, use your computer, because these, uh, these molecules are very large. So if you should go for quantum mechanics, today's computer would not be able to do this. So you have to home into what you want to look at in the molecule and use the quantum mechanics there. So the, the ingenious thing in that contribution was how to combine this local spotlight 
with the uh, the global view, and uh, they they had a machinery for that. Um, what do you think uh, the country you know could benefit from in terms of its preparation for uh, you know trying to plant the seeds, as you said? Mm -hmm. To prepare yourself, you could have uh, an interest in having um, a sound education, which you have already. Um, an academic structure that allows the scientists to use their curiosity to steer towards uh, problems that are important. But the most important thing is that you must ask the right questions. And Francis Crick once said, uh, a big question uh, gives a big answer. Well, the Swedish government has been very successful in nurturing an environment with its policies. Um, what, what stands out there? What can we take away from that? I think that what we have gone for in the Swedish Research Council is the young individuals, which means that each project is competing with all other projects. We are not saying that we will give so much money to biological research, so much money to material and so on, but we have essentially, that with some exceptions, kept it in a big pot and the best man or woman may win. Of any sciences? Of any sciences. And how does that have a side effect of, of creating a more robust scientific community? It's a very good question because you could uh, get a very instable system. Uh, uh, naturally, if a, a certain field is growing, there will be more scientists and more promising scientists and the best quality proposals will be there and it will continue to grow. Uh, so you need to have some policies, as you say, but these vary from field to field. And um, it's not easy to suppress a very strongly growing system. You, you, it might explode and, and take all the resources from all other fields. We haven't seen that yet, but it's a potential risk. So when you are with your colleagues, um, I'm sure your discussions are at a much different level than this discussion is at right now. What do you talk about? Uh, what, what's um, you know, top of your minds? What you know, big questions are you guys asking each other? Well, we look around and get inspired by everything we see. We see a piece of paper. We may ask wh what is keeping the, the molecules in this paper together? Or is there anything to le be learned about that? What keeps the water molecules together here? Of course, we know it in principle, but is there more to be learned? When I speak, my sound waves go into the glass, go through the water, many, many times faster when it goes through the water. What's happened to the sound when it goes through the water? Is that possible to understand on an atomic, atomistic level? The prize this year was for methods that potentially could simulate how the sound is transformed into pr pressure waves, what the molec individual molecules are doing. They are colliding with each other. And how are these collisions transformed into a wave that moves through the water? In principle, uh, you may ask, why should I want to model that? We already know that. But you could learn something from it. If you understand what's happened on the microscopic level, you could learn something. That could be useful for something else. Do you think we've become too oriented towards the practical value of what the scientific discovery um, can, can yield? And, 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 ha and does that constrain what pure scientists do? Yes, it, has, uh, it has, could have a negative effect especially if you go for a development where you think that you know how the research should do. You have a prejudice about it and you give very short time grants. They are not aiming for a longer perspective. You want to develop rather than doing research. And um, in industry you have to do that because you have to come up with products in a very short time that could sell. So, uh, but you need both. Uh, the great scientist uh, Louis Pasteur in France, uh, who was the discovery of, of um, the pasteurization of milk, by the way, and, and also uh, uh, some vaccines, uh, he used to say that um, uh, you need both the fundamental research and the applied. He was all the time thinking of the applied problems, but he was curious and he saw that when he played around with the basic things and he understood it, he could use it for the applications. 
So what, what still sparks your interest as a scientist and researcher? In my talk, when I opened the conference uh, the day before yesterday, Monday, uh, I gave two examples of uh, questions that we have addressed in my lab and which are quite general. One is why does all living systems require water? This is not known. I had a potential explanation. And the other was, why does three letters uh, determine the genetic code? You know of the DNA, DNA basis, exactly, the adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. They are combined in, in packages of three bases, so always. Why the number three? Why the number three? I'm so glad that you are thinking about this. I don't think, uh, yeah, right. The, the, I thought there was a reason um, why yes, we all needed well, water, but these are big questions. Still big questions, yes. Wow. And are you close to I think I, uh, an I uh, can answer for certainty why the water. And we have to wait until your article is published? Uh, I have indicated it in some publications already, but I, I will write the fuller. Wow. Yeah. So how have you found your trip here in Korea, and are you looking forward to coming again? I, I do. I, I, uh, I'm amazed. I have been received like I was the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain. <laughs> Limousines with Swedish flags and so on, everything. Wow. And you're so, going to continue some collaboration with some I of have our got, I've got some contacts, and uh, I, um, I look forward to have more collaboration. Uh, Next Molecular Frontiers um, conference will probably be in China, and then uh, next one will be in uh, Singapore, very probably. But I think that we shall return to Korea because it, uh, everything was so successful. It was very professional. The interest from the young people, the scientists was so good and so stimulated. So I am very happy. And we're very grateful for your visit and uh, your coming here to share your insights mm -hmm. about uh, science and uh, molecules and chemistry. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you. And that does it for us tonight on After 10. Today marks the one year anniversary of our program and we'd like to thank you for watching us during that time. We've looked at the major issues affecting Korean society with insight from over 80 prominent figures from a variety of fields. Since September, After 10 has been airing daily, Monday through Friday, to give our viewers a more realistic analysis on the pending issues. And we've received many comments throughout the course of our program. And please stick with us for more exciting interviews and in-depth discussions. Thanks so much.